All right, so today we're going to continue with our discussion of gases, and we're going to look at um, something that's kind of derived from Dalton's Law, and that's using mole fractions to determine partial pressures. So I'm just going to ask you a generic question, and you're going to be able to answer it because you know math and you know how things work, okay? Let's say in this room I had three gases, only three floating around, okay? And they all were the same number of moles. If my total pressure of the room were 300 torr, what would be the pressure of each gas? 100, right? What, what made you get that? Somebody speak. What made you? JD? Right. Dividing by three. So you're basically giving equal weight to each gas, not weight as in mass, equal, equal right to each gas. All gases, okay, at the same pressure, at the same temperature, at the same volume, are going to have the same number of moles, all right? So we're allowed to do this proportionality thing, and it's really cool, because if you think about ooh, PV equals NRT, our number of moles and our pressures are proportional if our volume and temperature stays the same. So that's what all of this is kind of assuming. So... What we're looking at first is the mole fraction of a gas. This is just like mole fractions we did when we did solutions last year. We didn't do mole fractions of gases, but we did mole fractions of solutions, where you put moles of whatever gas you're looking for over the total moles. So let's say the three gases in the room are oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. If we wanted the mole fraction of the CO2, we would put the moles of the CO2 over the moles of the oxygen plus the moles of the nitrogen plus the moles of the CO2. Does that make sense? And I want you guys to get used to writing these subscripts to describe what it's the moles of. What is this the mole fraction of? CO2. And I want you to understand that you can get the mole fraction of any one of the gases. No gas is different than the other. Keep in mind these are fractions. We don't multiply by a thousand, I'm not a thousand, a hundred to turn it to a percent. We always keep them in, in decimals, all right? Um, so this leads us to the use of a very important little formula. This little formula, when it's liquids, we call it Raoult's Law. But what this is basically saying, if you take the mole fraction of a certain gas that you want and multiply it by the total pressure, it's going to give you the partial pressure of this, that gas. When I say partial pressure, don't let it scare you. It's just the pressure of that one gas. And that's kind of what you did when you told me what the pressure of each gas was, right? You took the total pressure and you multiplied it by a third because this thing was one-third moles of whatever gas I was talking about. And so this stuff is just proportions. It's really, really easy. And then this is just a rearranged equation of the same thing, which you don't need to worry about. This is provided for you on the AP equation sheet. Um, Starting, next, starting this unit, when you do quizzes, you guys are going to be finally allowed to use these. In the top corner right here, it says gases, liquids, and solutions. This is the section that you're going to be allowed to use. If you, you can't see it, I know, but it gives you the ideal gas law, which we'll talk about today, P equals NRT, like you really need it, and it gives you this equation. The partial pressure of A is equal to the partial pressure of the total, or the pressure of the total times the mole fraction of A. I still want you to kind of know it because it's just a fraction and it's just a proportion, so I don't really think you need this. But if your brain freezes up, it actually does that for you. And then most importantly, they give you the very difficult Dalton's Law, where it says P total is equal to PA plus PB plus PC. I'm so glad they gave that to you because that's a rough one. So anyway, and then in addition, you get your gas constant, your universal gas constant on here with units that you'll be able to access if you get brain freeze. I don't want you to strictly depend on this, so I want you to be able to use it as a, as a help if, if you start freaking out. All right, so let's do number seven. It says, the mole fraction nitrogen in air is 0 0.7808. So let's practice this writing. Mole fraction of subscript nitrogen is equal to 0 0.7808. Calculate the partial pressure we're looking for the pressure of just the nitrogen. 
when the atmospheric pressure is 760. What does the atmospheric pressure represent? Exactly, total pressure. So P total times the mole fraction is going to be equal to, and I should have put in P total in there, sorry. Let me rewrite this. P total times the mole fraction is going to be equal to the partial pressure of just the nitrogen. And I meant to write this in formula. There you go. All right. So to three sig figs, what is it? Five what? 593? Can I get a second on that? Yes, 593 tor. And that makes sense. It better be less than the total, right? So whatever other gases, their partial pressures when added will equal to our 760. All right? Does everyone understand that proportionality? Cool. Let's do the next one. The partial pressure of oxygen was observed to be 156 tor. With an atmospheric pressure, again, that's P total, of 743 torr. Calculate the mole fraction of O2 present. Remember, this is a fraction, right? So you can do one of two things. You could do part over whole here, and that'll give you the fraction. Or you can still plug it into the same equation, where P total times the mole fraction of O2 is equal to the partial pressure of O2, and plug it in and solve. You're mathematically doing the exact same thing. So our total is 743 tor. We're looking for the mole fraction, and our partial pressure is 156 tor. So to three sig figs, what are we getting? That point 0.2, that seems a little small. Is that right? I don't do math in my head. Point 0.210. Now, there are no units on these mole fractions. So what I expect to see is the number being equal to x of whatever gas we're looking at. This is how I want you to format your answers. Yes, Noah. Say it again. No, I don't care. I'm not going to ding you for that. I only did it this way because I happened to have written that down first. But no, either way is fine. But just know it's unitless. And do not turn it to a percent. Okay, you've got to leave it in decimal. Questions before we move on? Because that's pretty much all we're doing with no mole fractions. Easy stuff, huh? All right. Yay, ideal gas law. Do you all remember this one? PV equals NRT. Some people call it PIVNERT. Actually, most of the people call it PIVNERT. I don't roll that way. I say PERVNERT because it sounds like pervert, which is way more interesting. So, pervnert is the equation we use for ideal gas laws, okay? Every gas, and this works for whatever gas it is. Again, if we have the same pressure, the same temperature, the same volume, the number of moles of gas is going to be the same. And this shows us that relationship. So right here, I know it looks really small. It's deceptively small, and I still don't get why. I'd like to try it out. But 22.4 liters of a gas is the number of liters found of a mole of any gas when at standard temperature and pressure. So only at that point are we allowed to use that 22.4 that you learned. All right. If we're in a situation where we're not at standard temperature and pressure, that's when you use this guy in order to figure out moles or figure out one of the other variables. What makes this different than what we did yesterday well, let me ask you, what makes this different? Yesterday we did the combined gas law. How, how are these problems different? Any ideas? OK, moles aren't involved. That's kind of what I was looking for. There's no change. This is a change of conditions to find. When something changes, something what, what's, an, what's the response? What's the result? Here. It's a single set of conditions, and you're told to figure out one of those things. Okay? And yeah, moles being in the problem is kind of an indicator that you're using the ideal gas law. Um, so the units of all these are dictated by the units on the R, 
the universal gas constant. The units on this are our latum molk. That's how I remember it, latum molk. Liter atmosphere, latum over mole K, latum molk. It's a really easy way to remember it. You need to match up your units with what's in the R. Now one thing, and I, I don't want to talk too much about it because I think it's just as difficult. On your sheet, they do provide you with an alternative gas constant for TOR, where it's the same number, it's 62.36. Instead of LATAM, it's LATOR um, MOLC. So you could use this one, if you have this sheet, and plug it in with TOR as your pressure, or millimeters of mercury as your pressure unit, but you still are having to convert something. So my advice is to stick to this and always convert to atmospheres. It's going to be your most common one, and it's the one that I kind of want you to know. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at the first problem. What pressure is required to confine 0 .60, 4.460 moles of an ideal gas, 33, volume of 9.5? So we're looking for pressure. Now, you might have learned this through dimensional analysis. If you had Ms. Rozier, or Ms. Richardson, I think you learned it with dimensional analysis where you start with your R and you're like, okay, I'm looking for pressure, so I'm going to put this where the pressure is on top, and then I'm going to just put my other stuff in dimensional analysis and cancel out. You're welcome to do that. I like doing plug and chug with PV equals NRT because of the non-ideal gas law that we're looking at, which is basically this on steroids, so I want you to get used to that equation. So I'm just going to plug in and, and solve. If you choose to do dimensional analysis, that's fine. I'm not going to, I don't care which one you guys decide. So we're looking for pressure. Do we have a volume? Is it in the correct unit? Yes. Do we have moles? Yep. What's my R? Now, oh, here's another thing. Um, I know this says 0.0821. I want, as a class rule, us to be doing 0.08206 because that's what's on that sheet. Okay? So do 0.08206. Last year we didn't, and there was all this controversy, and everyone's like, but I got a different answer. And I'm like, I know, it's because you used a different R, but it's fine. So this way we won't get into any stressful discussions about it. This is what's going to be given to you every quiz and every test, all right? And then our temperature, what do we have to do to it? At 273, so what do we get? 306 Kelvin. All right, so to 333, to 366, go ahead and tell me what our new pressure is. 1. what to? 1. Point 2.2, and the pressure is in ATM because we use Latimolk R. How y'all doing? Y'all scored the highest average on the test again, by the way. You're very quiet today. It's making me nervous. What's the hill? Oh, the hump day? Okay, got it. Okay. All right. <laughs> it makes. Oh, did you just do this next problem? No, the hump day. Why hump day? Oh. Uh, that's funny, Berkeley. That reminds me of the day I figured out that afternoon meant afternoon. Like, never registered. So, yeah, I'm with you. It's good. It's a good feeling, huh? <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's just great moments. Because you don't want to get up, so you're sad, so you're mourning. No, I'm kidding. I just made that up. I have no idea. No, that's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> um, all right. So let's do this one. Determine the volume one mole of gas at STP. So if they give you STP, you know what to plug in the pervnert, right? Oh, y'all stopped me. Thank you. Last period didn't stop me, and they let me go. Why did you say 22.4? Okay, well, you know what? 
since you guys are so smart, I'm not. I'm still not going to skip it. I want to prove it to you. So let's plug those in. This is just to show you that it's legit. Any gas with a pressure of what? 1 atm. We're looking for the volume of 1 mole, and it's R is 0 0.08206 latimolts, and its temperature is 298. You should get 22.4 when you do that. Prove it to yourselves. You are proving the concept of this balloon, this beach ball right here. Did y'all get 22.4? Yep. All right, cool. All right, so with this one, next one, this is going to be a new, a new little bit of a concept for you. Um, in this question, notice. They're asking you to calculate density of a gas. If they ever ask you to calculate density or molar mass, I'm going to give you a special equation that you're going to love. Okay? It's the best equation ever, and it's easy to remember. It's not on the green sheet, though. So your only job is to remember if you need the density of a gas or the molar mass of a gas, you need to use this equation. Before I show you the equation, I want to start with units. Density, when we were doing density of water, that first lab, what were our units in? What? Grams per milliliter, right? Gases are a little bit different. A mill of gas doesn't weigh a whole hell of a lot. So what do you think we do our density in? Liters. So the units on our acceptable density for this equation we're going to be talking about is grams per liter. Um, molar mass, same grams as always. Same grams, same units as always, grams per mole, correct. All right, so those are the units of what we're looking for, and these will give you clues as to how to figure out what the density of the molar mass is. So how many of you guys have had a cat or have a cat? Okay. Abby, what, what does the cat, when it goes to the bathroom, right, it goes in the litter box, what does it do before it gets out of the litter box? Scratches. What is it doing more than scratch? It's doing it. It's trying to do something. What is it, Jacob? It's covering it up, right? So this equation I'm about to show you is the meow. And instead of molar mass, it's molar weight, just because I wanted it to look like meow. Molar weight is equal to what the cat does. What does the cat do? Puts the dirt over the pee. Right here is a picture of our molecular weight kitty cat. It's in the litter box. All right. So you can use this equation to find density of a gas or to find molar weight of a gas. Now, you might not be given density in the problem, but you'll be given grams and liters, so you'll be able to put it in there. Okay? Got it? And you might not be given molar mass of an unknown gas, but you'll be given grams, and you'd have to be given the number of moles, so you can put it in there. So I just want you to use this equation. I'm not going to do the other method. So let's do that now that we know that equation. Calculate the density. Oh, density. I need the meow equation. Cat puts their dirt over their P. So I'm looking for the D. Do I know the molar weight of oxygen? 32.0 grams per mole is equal to, I'm looking for the density, my R is still the universal gas constant R with the correct units. In this one, you've got to use 0.08. You can't do that tour one. 0.08206 latum. I'm being very careful with my units here because I'm going to show you how they work. Temperature, 273 because it says STP divided by 1 atm. So let's just take a look at our units just across holistically. The atmospheres go. I got moles here and moles here. My Kelvin, because I had a lot of mulk, my Kelvins here cancel, right? So what am I left with? Liters and grams. So when I divide and solve, I get grams per liter as my density. 
Now, we don't have sig figs, and you're like, what do we use for sig figs? There's no number. Rule of thumb on the AP, based on how they grade with a plus or minus one leeway on most problems, round to three. You'll be safe with three. So let's go ahead and figure out what the density is to three sig figs. I can't hear you, JD. Can I get a second on that? 1.43 grams over liters is our density. So 1.43 grams, if you have a liter and you weigh it, it weighs 1.43 grams. That's pretty light if you think about that. I mean, think about your bullet. What did the bullet casing weigh, like three, gram, three something? An entire liter of oxygen only weighs a third of that. And that's if we have perfect conditions, standard conditions. How do you feel about that? Easy? All right, let's do another one. A compound has the empirical formula CHCl. A 256 mil flask at 373 and 750 torr contains 0.8 grams of this gas. Give the molecular formula. So forget what you know about gases. If you have an empirical formula, and you, they want to know the molecular formula, what do you have to find? The molar mass. So yeah, this isn't directly asking for molar mass of the gas, but you need the molar mass to do it. So you use the meow. So again, dirt over P, and this time we're going to solve for the molar, the molar mass. Um, there's a lot of substitution going on with units here that we've got to be careful with. They don't give us density directly, but what do they give us? grams, and you're allowed, if you want to solve for density on the side and plug in, you can. I think that's a waste of time. So we're going to put 0 0.80 grams over, i got to make that liters, so 0.256 liters. This is an acceptable way to show conversions on the AP. As long as we can see that, we know we, you know what you're doing. Okay? R is 0 0.08206 Latum Molk. And then our temperature is what? 373 over, again, with the pressure, you don't have to do it separate if you don't want to. If you want to figure out that number on the side, you can. But since we have 750 torr, dividing that by 760 torr per atmosphere gives you the number in atmospheres. And I was going to address that. Do you have to? Not always. But I'll tell you what's happened in the past. In the past, when I was grading the AP, there was a problem that nationally students were tanking. So they were like, we've got to find a way to give students credit. So what they did, they went back and they looked at their substituted equation for specific units. Did they plug in kilopascals? Did they plug in tour atmosphere, whatever? They looked for those units. And if those units were shown, they gave them a point. Now, nowhere was that predetermined, and that's the thing about the AP. The way they're going to grade it is not predetermined until they study student papers. So in that case, you wanted to do that to get your points. So I say, I'm not big. If you don't do this unsubstituted equation first, I know in physics they might make you do the unsubstituted first. I'm OK if you don't show that, as long as you show the plug-in with all the units. And that's what I need to see, just to be safe. OK, so what is our molar mass? Just molar mass as we do two decimals, right? What is it? Ninety six point nine three grams per mole. Now that's not what the question is asking. The question wants to know, OK, we have an empirical formula of CHCl. How do we figure out? What do we need to do next? Perfect. Find the mass of the empirical formula and then see what multiple we're dealing with here. What is the mass of the empirical formula? 48.47-ish, right? So what is our, our multiple here? Two. Times 2, correct. So our overall molecular formula, final answer is C2H2Cl2. And that would be something you'd have to show in box. Or not box, but I want you to box. Because again, as a grader, path of least resistance. 
if I see a correct answer box, I am less apt to go back and look for errors or issues in the actual problem. Abby? No, you still need to put the units in. And I'm telling you just from experience, writing the units, students catch mistakes. And it really does help. It's not a matter of, you know, you guys not knowing it, but it's easy to make a mistake. Another question, especially when we get to Graham's Law in a few days, and you have to be in kilograms and not grams, forgetting to write those units, you're not going to recognize that your stuff's not canceling out. All right, last problem, and then we're going to talk about the online lab on Friday. This is kind of a, a merging of stoichiometry with gas laws. Okay, so this is just simple stoichiometry and then having to, to do some converting of that gas to find something we need via the ideal gas law. So in this problem it says calculate the volume of H2, we're looking for the volume of H2, when 0.98 atm, blah, 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 wait, calculate it formed at, so this is, these are conditions here of this gas, okay? When 98.3 grams of this guy are passed through an iron tube, okay? So we're basically forcing some creation of a gas, and we want to know how many liters, what's the volume of the gas that we form. Who wants to kind of talk me through the first thing I'm going to want to do? Amelia. Do we go to the volume directly? You're right. We find moles of this guy, and then we're going to do what? Mole bridge, correct? Then what do we do from there? We're going to get moles in our calculator. Then what do we do? Naira. Exactly. Then we take that and put it in the ideal gas law along with these conditions. What would we do differently if we were at standard conditions? Right. We could continue our dimensional analysis. And for every one mole of hydrogen, we'd have 22.4 liters, and we wouldn't have to use the ideal gas law. But that only works at STP. So with this, we're going to have to use the ideal gas law. So let's go ahead and start our dimensional analysis. 98.3 grams of H2O. To get on the mole bridge, we've got to be in moles. So for every one mole of H2O, how many grams do I have? 18.02 grams, my grams cancel, and now I can mole bridge. What's my ratio? 4 to 4. For every 4 moles of H2O, I have 4 moles of H2 on top because that's what I'm looking for. Unlike other problems where I needed to go one other step, we're done here, okay? We need to use the moles that we're about to get. So what do we want to do? And if you want to make this one huge dimensional analysis problem and put in the R, and do that canceling, you can, but I don't, I don't want to do it. I want to do this. So what do we get for moles of H2? Five point, whoa, that's a lot of moles. So we're not done yet. We're going to take those moles now, and what are we going to do? We're solving for, what did the problem ask for? These aren't rhetorical questions, guys. I actually want to respond. We're looking for volume, right? That's why I wrote the V on the thing. Again, don't you see me doing my little secretarial work ahead of time? It's going to speed up your process if you um, write your stuff. So I wrote grams here. I'm looking for volume. By doing that, I'm always knowing what I'm looking for. I don't have to reread through the problem eight times because I keep forgetting. All right? It just makes it faster. So we're going to go ahead and plug in our conditions. The pressure they're giving us is 0.98 atm. We're looking for volume. The moles are 5.46 moles. The R is 0.08206 latimolks. Hold on. Oh, that's 7. You're telling me, Kelvin, 7 what? 723? 723 Kelvin. We had to change to Kelvin because we were in degrees Celsius. So with all that being said and done, to two sig figs, what is my number of 
liters. 330. It's a lot of damn liters. That's impressive. Think about 100, 100 grams of water is like 100 mils, right? You know 100 mils of water in a graduated cylinder is about that much? Can make 330 liters of oxygen in a certain reaction. Is that not mind blowing? <sighs> kind of blows my mind. Okay, their minds aren't blown. All right, um, so that's today's lesson, but I do want to talk about the lab you guys are doing. Um, this is going to be your first online lab. We're not doing this online lab just because it's busy work. Okay? The reason we do this lab as an online lab is because it's really, really hard to get good data. And you guys freak out when you have like a 3% a error. I've done this lab so many years, and every year I get like 150% errors. Like it's almost not worth doing because the error is so bad. It's just hard. It's a hard method. Um, it's called the Dumas method. And the point of this is to find the molar mass of a volatile liquid. You might be asking, whoa, molar mass of a liquid? I thought we were in the gas unit. We are. But what word of that makes you think of gases? Volatile. We're going to utilize the properties of gases to give us the data we need to figure out what the molar mass of that liquid is. Because we can very easily put that liquid in a gas state. All right? So I'm just going to kind of talk you to the procedure to give you an idea. You still have to do a normal pre-lab. That's due Friday. If we run out of time, I have no idea what's going to go on with the schedule Friday. Um, I don't think there's a pep rally. I think they canceled the pep rally. So um, I'm pretty sure we can get the lab done in one sitting. These labs have to be done in one sitting. You can't do it and go back and log in again. If you log in again, the data is gone. The data is not kept in there. And that's why you have to send your results to the teacher before you exit out every time. Because it goes away. It disappears, it dis disappears as soon as you leave the, uh, leave the website. Okay? So in this lab, which, well, let's talk about first calculations. We're going to find the molar mass of the volatized liquid, which is a gas. If I need the molar mass of a liquid, what items, pieces of data, do I need to solve for that now that we know our fancy equation? What do we need? Pressure, volume, okay, that's something I'm going to measure in the lab. Am I going to measure density in the lab? What am I going to measure in the lab? Grams. What else am I going to measure? We're missing one. Temperature. All right, so it's dirt over P, right? This is where I get my, my D. R is a constant, so I don't need to worry about that. T, so that's dirt over P. So these are the items I need to collect. Okay? So right now I'm going to talk about how you're going to get all these different things in the lab. All right? So first thing you start with, and excuse my drawing, is you're going to have a little Erlenmeyer flask. And it's going to have you weigh the flask with this little cap on it. It's an aluminum, it's like an aluminum cover. That's all it is. And they're going to have you weigh that. And so you're going to have the initial mass of your flask plus the cap. Okay? Everyone good? Now you're going to take that and they're going to have you submerge it in water. Okay? Oh wait, before you do that. You're going to dump in literally a few mils of the unknown molar mass liquid. Okay? And then you're going to punch a few holes, dink, 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 with a pin in the top of the aluminum. Then you're ready to go. You're going to submerge it in water and then place it on a hot plate. Now I can't remember if they have you putting it on a hot plate or putting it under a Bunsen burner. It doesn't matter. It's going to heat the water, right? You're going to have a constant recording of the temperature of the water. So when you start heating this, what's going to happen to the liquid? It didn't matter how much we put in there, because the liquid, when it vaporizes, is going to expand perfectly to the size of the container, and the rest is going to leave. So as we heat it, what's going to happen? Gas is going to do what through the holes? 
leave. So on this, it's really funny to watch. They actually show you the little convection currents coming out of the, I don't know if you call it convection, I don't remember all the physics terms, of the gas coming out. That's all the excess gas that doesn't fit in this volume leaving. Okay? Because we just put a bunch of mills in here. It doesn't matter how many, everything's going to leave but the amount of gas that fills that space. Okay? In real life when you do this, you have to look and like bend over and you see, you know like on hot days, you can look at the pavement and see that's exactly what you're looking for here. So as the second that these convection currents stops, you're going to collect the temperature. And so that's where we get our temperature from the heat of the water at the point when the gas is perfectly filling that flask. Is everyone with me? You're going to take this flask out and you're going to put it on the table. What's going to happen as the flask sits on the table? It's going to cool down and, and the gas that fits perfectly is going to do what? Recondense to a liquid. So that, while that goes on, you can be recording the temperature, all that jazz. All right? Then you're going to get the mass of your flask after, after it's cooled. What is this data going to give me, mass of the flask before and the mass of the flask ask after? Grams of what? My mom? Grams of the gas, but it's no longer gas, it's a liquid, but at the conditions that you took the temperature at, it was a gas. So it'll give you grams. So there's our grams. These grams here that you need come from the difference. Pressure, I'm going to get from a barometer that's hanging in the, lab, in the online laboratory. Barometer, barometer, all right? Now, let's talk about volume. This is a good one. How are you going to find the volume of the gas in that flask? The graduation marks on anything only go up so high. That gas isn't going to know to stop at the line, the gas is going to fill the entire container. If I asked you to find the volume of this entire container, what, what physically would you have to do? Berkeley. Okay, pour water in it, and then what are you going to do with that water? How are you going to measure it? Like legitimately, if I sent you to the back of the room to do it, what would you use? It's okay, Anyone, someone help her. Yeah, you're going to take the water. You're going to fill that flask up to the tippy top with water, and you're going to pour it into a graduated cylinder. might have to be done a couple times to figure out the volume of the gas that was in here at that temperature. So you get that from doing the water fill thing. All right? That's the data. Once you have all that data, bam, you can plug it in and solve for the molar, molar mass. This is a lab you will be graded on, on accuracy because it's a computer, and if you do it, it's going to work. And if you do the calcs right, you're going to get the answer that you submit to me. Okay? Are we good? Okay. Well, that's it. Go ahead and start working on your homework.